To this lonely hillside, high above the valley of Sparta in southern Greece, pilgrims still come one day a year to make their offerings. They light their candles to a Christian saint, but his altar stands on a far more ancient pagan shrine. For this place, was once dedicated to the face that launched a thousand ships, Helen of Troy. According to legend, it was because of Helen that the heroes sailed from Greece to attack the city on the shore of Asia. Their leader was the most powerful of their kings, Agamemnon of Mycenae. Helen, queen of Sparta, had been abducted by Paris, the prince of Troy, and the Greeks wanted revenge. But after ten years of war, they could only take Troy by a trick, by the wooden horse. They demolished the city, slaughtered its men, and took the women back as concubines or menials. Ever since, those women have stood as an image of the fate of the conquered in war. The two most famous facts in the legend are also the most incredible. That a woman caused the war and that it was brought to an end by a wooden horse. Can there be any truth in such fairy tales? So far in our search, we have found that a city did indeed exist where Greek tradition said Troy had stood, near the mouth of the Dardanelles in what is now Turkey. There was a finely built royal fortress here on its windy ridge. The Greek bards of Homer's day believed that 500 years before their time, this wealthy place was sacked by an army which had come from Greece. For the bards, the incontestable central fact of the tale was the fateful overseas expedition to Troy from Golden Mycenae. in the Peloponnese, southern Greece. The most powerful citadel in Greece in the Bronze Age, it has given its name to the whole culture, Mycenaean. The bards of Homer's day said that for three generations, Mycenae was the center of a loose confederacy of allies, a kind of empire. 
But could a historical Agamemnon have been a great king who commanded lesser kings to war? Could he have led an imperial expedition from this tiny place to devastate the shores of Asia Minor? In the 13th century BC, you approached Mycenae by a paved road from the sea at Tiryns. Road systems are often signs of imperial power, and even today you can see traces of the roads and their massive bridges which centred on Mycenae. As you walked on up the valley, you came to the first of a series of tremendous royal tombs, their facades once decorated with coloured marble imported from other parts of Greece. These so-called treasuries, built for kings of Mycenae in the generations before the Trojan War, made a great impression on the first excavator of Mycenae, Heinrich Schliemann. The treasury of Atreus is one of the most stupendous monuments of the Bronze Age. Nearly 50 feet in diameter, 44 feet to the top of that beehive shape. With perfectly joined courses of stone, a single block weighing 120 tons at the lintel. And when it was constructed, its interior walls studded with decoration, bronze rosettes and spirals. It had been obvious to early travellers, and it was obvious to Schliemann when he came here, that the society which could construct such a masterpiece, which could lavish such skill and ingenuity on a tomb for a single king, must have been not only tremendously powerful, but fantastically rich in artistic achievement. Once crammed with treasure, the tomb chamber is now wrecked, but we can imagine its walls adorned with beautifully carved slabs of alabaster. The royal tombs of Mycenae show that several generations of great kings must have ruled here. Five hundred yards away up the valley on its hill is the royal citadel itself, the residence of Agamemnon. The so-called Cyclopean fortifications of Mycenae were built around 1300 BC, a generation or two before the time of the Trojan War. Also part of this building program was the famous Lion Gate. This was the main gate of Mycenae at the height of its power. And one's first impression walking up here is of being almost overwhelmed by the sheer monumental force of the masonry and the sculpture. It's a prehistoric masterpiece of architecture. The emblem shows two lions with their paws on an altar on either side of a column. On the top of the column, uh, the representation of a building structure, presumably Mycenae itself. In other words, this is a coat of arms, the coat of arms of Agamemnon's family, the earliest in Western art. Just inside the Lion Gate, to the right, you come upon one of the most interesting features of the, the later citadel at Mycenae, and one that gives a really fascinating insight into the psychology of the kings who ruled in the 13th century. Uh, the kings who ruled at the time to which tradition assigns the Trojan War. This is the great grave circle excavated so sensationally by Heinrich Schliemann. It lay originally outside the walls of the citadel, but at just this time, a new 
enclosing Cyclopean wall was constructed in order to bring this grave circle within the walls of the fortress itself. And the whole area was extensively refurbished in order to become an object of show. Uh, a new supporting terrace was built for this side of the, of the circle. These elaborate standing stones were erected to form uh, uh, an ornate enclosure and the grave markers themselves, bearing the emblems of the, the dead heroes, the dead kings, were, were repositioned. It's almost like uh, the sort of Westminster Abbey of the Mycenaean royal family. Graves which were already ancient to Agamemnon, if he existed, have now become the focus for veneration and for cult. And the Mycenaean royal family itself, in the mid-13th century, is showing an acute awareness of history, of dynasty and of pedigree. So, at the time of the Trojan War, the king of Mycenae saw himself as the inheritor of a great tradition reaching back 300 years to the kings buried in the shaft graves. top, a truly royal setting, the plain of Argos stretching below you, the mountains of Arcadia and Peloponnese, some of them still touched by snow even at the start of May, and over there Argos on its high mound and the gulf of the sea beyond it. What a view. Who's to say that Mycenaean builders didn't choose the finest positions for their royal patrons? and surely their royal patrons must have enjoyed this. These are the royal apartments, spacious columned halls, floored with soft stucco, with gypsum surrounds. This is the throne room itself, the door pins for the entrance, the central hearth, the wooden columns framing it. And here the Mycenaean kings feasted their guests or their royal kinsmen after the boar hunts and the lion hunts. Here, perhaps, they heard bards singing of their deeds in Mycenaean Greek. And around them, uh, the walls glowed with frescoes depicting their deeds and the deeds of their ancestors. The king of Mycenae then would seem to have surpassed the other kings in Greece in the 13th century BC. But is it possible that as Homer says, such a wealthy and powerful king could have ruined himself in a war for a woman? For a woman perhaps of the kind portrayed on the walls of the Greek palaces? Homer's story was that Agamemnon was able to persuade his allies to go to Troy to fight for Helen because the other kings of Greece, who had been suitors for her hand, had sworn to recover her. George Milonas, present excavator of Mycenae. 
Agamemnon became the leader of this expedition, this common expedition, not because everybody that wanted Helen gave an oath to her father that he was going to defend her, but because Agamemnon was the most mighty leader of the period. And therefore, even the people that had an opinion there indicated that for this common uh, enterprise, they chose the best man, the my most mighty man, yes. and that was Agamemnon. Not because he was an emperor or well, anything like that, exercising authority. And another thing, all these roads that we traced, they go up to a certain point. If it was an empire, you would expect those roads to go beyond that point that it was limited, limiting the other. So you don't you don't believe in a, a, an empire in the in the modern sense? No, I don't believe in an empire. I believe that Mycenae was a very important state. I believe that it had a tremendous uh, commercial activity. I believe that it communicated to the sea by means of tyrants. I believe that Tyrant was a dependency of Mycenae, that the king of Mycenae had one of his sons maybe out there as a prince, because no ruler would have allowed another person uh, to build a, such an important place that might have become a source of the beginning of an attack against his... And you must remember that the people there, the people that lived, that formed this state, lived outside the walls, scattered all over the area. The plain of Argos below Mycenae could have supported half a million people in the Bronze Age. It's ringed by huge fortresses, the biggest of which is Tyrins, Tyrins of the Great Walls, as Homer calls it, from which legend said King Diomedes led 80 black ships to Troy. Tiryns was perhaps the main port of the Argolid. From the plain, the industrial powerhouse of the Mycenaean world, trade goods flowed across the eastern Mediterranean. Factories here produced thousands of stirrup jars in which oil or perfume were exported. In return, the Greeks imported raw materials such as tin and copper to make the bronze weapons on which their power rested. By the 13th century BC, the same palace civilization is found all over Greece. It has been called the Age of Imperial Mycenae. If we use the word imperial of Mycenae, we need to be very careful about what we mean. Homer says that Agamemnon was king of southern Greece and of many islands. And when you look at a map like this, uh, with Mycenae in red stretching across the Aegean, that seems very plausible. But this is a map of Mycenaean contacts and settlements, and it shouldn't delude us. What we really need to know is the internal political geography of mainland Greece. And a lot more is known about that than was known in the days of Schliemann and Dirtfeld and even Blagan. It would appear that mainland Greece was divided into about six or seven uh, uh, powerful city-states, much bigger than later classical ones, with high degree of prosperity, large populations, and massive technology, especially military, much of which was aimed against each other. Two of these kingdoms we know a great deal about because of the Linear B tablets, Knossos and Pylos. And there we have clear pictures of highly centralized states uh, dominating their areas of central Crete and of Messenia. It gives us, I think, a plausible model, at least to work with, that uh, what we have here is a series of city-states, sometimes friends, sometimes enemies, who could, at certain times, acknowledge the leadership of the most powerful. For the kings of the palaces of Mycenae and Greece worshipped the same gods. They spoke the same language, recorded on identical Linear B clay tablets. <laughs> 
They shared the same artists, architects and stonemasons and the same taste in decoration. There was constant exchange between them of luxury goods and raw materials, whether expensive ornamental stone or oil or perfume in mass-produced stirrup jars. But if this loose confederacy cooperated so closely in time of peace, could they not have done so in time of war? Empires, of course, only exist by war. They live on aggression and exploitation. We can see this in our own history. Retrospectively, we, like Homer, admire the Victorian values of the empire builders and forget their mode of operation. These are the vaults of what was one of the oldest private banks in Liverpool, Haywards. They were built in 1799. And these are the accounts of a Liverpool family who owned estates in Jamaica around about that time. They itemise not money or stocks and shares, but people. Eleanor, a nurse, aged 42, healthy. Charlotte, a field hand, aged 37, sickly. Mary, unemployed, aged three and a half. They're African slaves, originally from Angola or the mouth of the Congo River. And it's astonishing to think that only 150 years or so ago, this is what lay behind the glittering facade of the British Empire. Well, it's a remarkable fact, but records exactly like this exist for Bronze Age Greece. And they may point us not only to the Trojan War, but towards the real-life women who may be the basis of the legend of the carrying off of Helen of Troy herself. The crucial evidence turned up in Carl Blagan's excavation at the Palace of Pylos in Messenia in the 1950s. Pylos, in Homer's story, is the home of Agamemnon's trusty old ally, King Nestor. Here, Blagan found the foundations of a 13th century BC palace. Even the painted hearth of the throne room was intact. Here, for the first time, the full detail of a Mycenaean royal hall could be recovered, the very room Homer imagines so vividly in the Odyssey. This is the throne room of Pylos, just as it was found by the excavators. From these burnt stumps, you can't get a real idea of what a blaze of colour this must have been. The ceiling painted with glazed roundels and decoration, the walls covered with frescoes with griffins and mythological creatures, and the floor, above all else, absolutely shining with colour. Most of it's been covered now to uh, protect it from the, the feet of the many visitors, but you can make out here that, in fact, it was originally covered with painted stucco with crisscross lines all over it, making about a hundred squares of colour with different designs in all of them, linear designs, wavy designs, shell designs, fish, octopus. So the whole floor was a blaze of blues, reds, whites and blacks. And in the middle was the royal hearth itself, opposite the throne over there where King Nestor sat. And here's the hearth, virtually intact, where the great fire burned. You can still see the painted design around it. And in the story in Homer, when Telemachus arrives in the room, the young blades of Nestor's caught a nonchalantly kebabbing beef on the fire and drinking red wine uh, uh, with their king. And here, uh, a noble guest would have received the gifts appropriate to the, the hearth of a great royal palace. But Blagan's most remarkable evidence concerned the lives not of the rich, but of the thousands below stairs. In the archive room, he found hundreds of Linear B tablets written in Bronze Age Greek, which itemized the lives of the workers, and especially women workers. Associated with several groups was a word, linon, flax, from which our word linen comes. <laughs> 
and near Pylos at the village of Kukunara, where flax was grown commercially until only 30 years ago, it is still possible to touch on their lives. This little stream is called Linaria, Flax River. And here for hundreds, probably thousands of years, the women of Kukunara have come, for it is women who perform this back-breaking task, come to the banks here to crush and break up the, the fibres of the flax stalk before laying it out for a week to rot in the warm, shallow water of the river, then drying it, and combing it and spinning it in order for it to be woven. But in the Bronze Age, they must have used it most of all for rope and for sails, the sails of ships, perhaps, that wafted Nestor to Troy. Troy seems a long way away from this idyllic place, but it's this very place that gives us a direct human contact with the ordinary people who lived and died all that time ago. And it's the flax women themselves who are the contact, because the tablets from the palace say that the women who worked the flax in this region and presumably on this very river 3,000 years ago were women from the coast of Asia Minor, from the coast below Troy, from Miletus, Halicarnassus and Cnidus. They must have been slaves. The tablets speak of rations for groups of 500 women, living perhaps on great estates where they worked the state industry, the flax industry. They were kept together. The tablets, for instance, speak of 21 women from Cnidus with their 12 girls and their 10 boys, not like American slave plantations where the families were broken up. And that, to my mind, is the strongest connection with the period of the Trojan War. That is a real direct contact, a truer and more eloquent testimony than trade routes to the thought world of Agamemnon and the sackers of cities. The surviving tablets list 1,700 foreign women and children on the flax plantations around Pylos. The women came from places widely scattered over the Aegean, from Cnidus, far to the south, from Zephyrus and Miletus, where Greek colonists actually settled, from Lemnos in the north, an island in sight of Troy. But most of them are simply called women of Asia, which originally meant the area south of Troy itself. If this is the correct interpretation of the tablets, it's crucial evidence in our search. Dr. John Chadwick of Cambridge University, who participated in the decipherment of the Linear B tablets, is an expert in the Pylos archive. It is very much as if you tried to reconstruct the administration of present-day England by going through half a dozen waste paper baskets in Whitehall and drawing your conclusions from that. Now, with that uh, first statement, I would go and say from this, the existence of personal slavery seems to be very questionable. There are only a few cases where we know of slaves belonging to important people. And it is not a slave-owning society in the classical sense at all. Uh, there is one exception to this, and that is in the royal establishments. At Pylos, we know there were about 500 women of menial status. They've got their children with them, but they have no husbands. Uh, almost certainly they're slaves, and for the most part, they're employed as what we would call industrial workers. If you compare it with Homer, it's an incredibly bureaucratic society, isn't it? It's not heroic at all. It's not heroic in that sense. No, it is a bureaucratic administration, and everything is carefully recorded and docketed. Uh, you cannot spend anything, you can't issue anything from the stores without filling in a chit. But it's still possible that Mycenaean kings or sons of kings could have ranged far and wide on predatory forays, even buying or seizing slaves. That is quite possible. Um, certainly we can be sure Pylos had a fleet. Uh, it was certainly mobilizing its fleet at the time when the tablets we have were written uh, for its own defense. So there is no reason why in more favorable times they should not have been engaged in expeditions overseas. We know some of these women I've just mentioned 
uh, are specifically called booty. They come from uh, some kind of piratical or warlike operation. Uh, we also have groups of women whose uh, titles indicate an origin on the east of the Aegean, from Anatolia. Uh, again, we don't know why they are called by these titles, but it does suggest that Pylos had wide-ranging contacts across the Aegean. So Homer was right. The heroes fought not only for the cities and their loot, but for their women. The seizure of women could have led to war. So could Helen have been a real person? The next stage of the search was obvious, to go to Sparta, where Helen was supposed to have lived with her husband Menelaus, brother of Agamemnon of Mycenae. You would have made this journey by sea in the Bronze Age, for in Greek history it has been the sea, not the land, which has been the unifier. This road through the Tigatus was only blasted through in the 1970s. Before then, you had a 12-hour mule trek. The mountains determined the political geography of Mycenaean Greece. Any unity can only have been nominal and fragile. On a steep hill above the plain of Sparta stands a monument. The classical shrine commemorating Helen and her husband. It's called the Menelaon. From at least the 8th century BC, pilgrims came up here and left offerings to the couple in the belief that they had really existed. A century ago, Schliemann came here and found nothing, but new excavations have located part of the palace, if a rather second-rate one, which could have been Helen's. Does the archaeology give any support to the idea of the Spartan Helen and her husband from Mycenae? The Mycenaean sites spread over all these three hills here with their magnificent views over the valley and the Tigatus Mountains. Uh, there's a Mycenaean building even on this little hill here underneath the church of Prophetis Ilias. It's never been excavated, but here by the church door, there's the column base, presumably from a mansion or even a palace that stood on this site. It seems that this, the Menelaean, was the capital site of the kingdom of Sparta during the 15th and 14th centuries. But at that time, it was abandoned for about a hundred years. And then, in around the very generation of the Trojan War, a new palace was erected on that flat plateau to the right of the, of the later shrine. And that palace had everything in common in its material culture with the palaces at Mycenae and at Pylos. It is on the face of it very tempting to think that this must have been the palace of Menelaus and Helen herself. It's difficult to be sure because we don't really know what we mean by royal families at this time. I suspect that in some ways they were rather like the Saudi royal family today or the great African king's families where there were many royal wives, there were many royal sons, brothers and queen mothers, all of whom had palaces. But this was the biggest palace at this time and surely has the best qualifications to be the palace of Menelaus. And if it was, then the rebuilding 
fits rather well with the legend because the legend says that it was not a Spartan who was king at the time of the Trojan War, but a foreigner, an outsider from the dynasty of Mycenae who had come here. So is it not possible that the rebuilding of the palace then uh, was by Menelaus himself in order to provide a new palace on an ancient site for his new wife, Helen? And long after Christianity had replaced ancient paganism, the holy aura of the hill remained. Even today, pilgrims come here, the aged and the sick, to keep their vigil once a year with the saint, and perhaps his shadowy predecessor, whoever she was. So Helen remains a tantalizing and ambiguous image. Whether she left for love or, as Homer has it, she was seized forcibly by Paris of Troy. When, he says, the Trojans took her with her women to the island of Crani. And that seems a suitably Homeric way to leave the mainland of Greece for the moment, because it was on Crani that Helen of Troy and Paris spent their first night of passion after her abduction from Sparta, when, as Homer says, Paris carried her off in his seagoing ships from lovely Laconia, and we spent the night in bed in each other's arms on the island of Crani. And so they sailed overseas to Troy to be followed by a Greek armada of a thousand ships bringing ruin upon the city and, as Homer says, pains a thousandfold upon the Greeks. The story of Paris and Helen is usually dismissed as romantic fiction, but some scholars think that such an abduction could have a place in the motives for a war against the city of King Priam. Professor John Luce of Trinity College, Dublin. It was a general attempt to uh, cause such difficulties for Priam's kingdom that they would capitulate to the Greek demands. And I would even go so far as to say that one of those demands was for the return of Helen, because uh, in the conditions of uh, fighting in, well, I was going to say heroic ages, but uh, I view the background as more medieval in the sense that it is a world of pageantry, of uh, kings and nobles, of, um, of knights uh, who, whose honour is all important and... Uh, and I can give you a very good parallel from the history of my own country as the Normans first came into Ireland and they were asked to do so by a, a local king called MacMara Kavanagh whose wife had left him and he wanted help to get her back, you see. So historically, there's nothing out of key to my mind with the abduction uh, by um, a Trojan of a Greek princess 
Obviously, the spheres of the Trojans and the Greeks were closely intermeshed in terms of trade. They had been for 100, 150 years before, a lot of coming and going between the two areas. And uh, th this could be uh, a cause. I, I don't, uh, in a complex situation, it's oversimplification to say it's the only cause. I mean, uh, it, would, it might have been something that Agamemnon was, was glad to, to take up this particular personal quarrel on behalf of his as brother. A, as an excuse for as war. As an excuse, well, excuse yes, for yeah, war, yeah. which would lead to aggrandizement, would lead to plunder, would lead to a further expansion of Mycenaean power on the, Tro on the Anatolian mainland. But you wouldn't rule out the possibility that Helen existed and that she was called Helen? <laughs> Not a bit, no. <laughs> <laughs> Helen's story is seductive, though in the end we cannot prove she existed. There may, however, have been more pressing economic motives which led the Mycenaean military on overseas expeditions to Asia Minor in the 13th century BC. The massive building projects at Mycenae and Tiryns came at the end of a long and stable period of economic growth. But despite the outward show, the 13th century BC seems to have been a period of growing economic decline. The king of Mycenae and his confederacy of allies had troubles at home. There was overpopulation. Their trade routes were under threat. The factories in the Argolid were on half production. The kings needed treasure, loot and slaves to keep their army loyal. They needed foreign war. It was in the nature of their rule. Economic necessity, or the world's most beautiful woman, the motive hardly mattered. Already in our search, we have seen that the Greek bards of the 8th century BC had traditions which connected heroic Greece with Troy. But is there archaeological evidence at Troy to back up their story? Pisalik, northwestern Turkey. Here, Greek bardic tradition said Troy had stood. Even before Homer's day, this overgrown and obscure ruin by the Dardanelles had become the focus of the Greeks' national epic. Here, their bards said had been a city of fine walls with strong gates and towers, a beautiful city standing high above the windy plain, a city whose kings were rich and civilized oriental potentates, famous for their fine horses. Over the last hundred years, three generations of excavators have dug here. They've brought to life the real city which stood here at the time of the heyday of Mycenae in the years after 1300 BC. The city's fine walls, remembered by the bards, were found by Wilhelm Derpfeldt in 1893. Its well-built towers included an imposing watchtower. With 500 years of stability behind it, this city is the one remembered in Greek tradition as Troy, though no one has yet been able to prove that the events in the Iliad actually happened here. The last excavator of Hisalik discovered that the city had extensive outside contacts, which were suddenly severed towards 1250 BC. In his finds of pottery, Carl Blagan found evidence of a trade with Cyprus and Syria. 
But remarkably enough, and perhaps this was a clue to its wealth, the oldest trading connections of the city were with none other than Mycenae itself. One of the intriguing things about Troy, when you consider that the Homeric story of a Greek expedition to sack the city, is that Troy, of all the places on the Anatolian coast, seems to have had the closest relationship with Mycenae, at least judging by the pottery, because Troy in its heyday of Troy VI imported vast amounts of Mycenaean pottery. Hundreds and hundreds of uh, vases were discovered on site, and especially the ubiquitous stirrup jar that we've already seen at, at Tiryns and Mycenae and on the coast of Anatolia. What Troy gave in return, the source of Troy's wealth, is almost impossible to say. Perhaps it was textiles, it may have been fish, uh, it could even have been, as Homer says, that they bred and exported horses. But whatever the reason for their wealth, uh, this place at its height was certainly a wealthy city. The people who lived in this citadel were able to build really grand houses like this one. This long rectangular building, you can make out its lines, with these two central columns here. That one's lost the top level, so the ceiling would have been about 10 feet above the ground. Uh, the lower story built of stone, the upper one perhaps of uh, uh, wattle and plaster, mud brick or timber, uh, rather like buildings in Anatolia today. But this would have been a princely dwelling for one of the, the chief citizens of Bronze Age Troy. Maybe a royal kinsman like Hector himself. I think we should imagine only 20 or 30 of these houses with the royal palace on the hill. But unlike the palaces at Pylos and Mycenae, we cannot now transport ourselves to the halls of the House of Priam, the palace to which Helen was taken. Unfortunately, all surviving trace of it was destroyed when Heinrich Schliemann gouged out the center of the site in the 1870s. All that remains is the walls and the outer row of houses. But by comparison with other cities in Anatolia, it is possible to deduce what the city of Hector and Priam probably looked like. James Mellot of the University of London. I'd like to know what the palace was like, and there's enough room for a palace. There's enough room for a, the sort of palace which you, let's say, would have had uh, both in Western Anatolia or in the Aegean. So you'd imagine the, the palace area really crammed with buildings and storerooms, would you? Yes, almost certainly. Obviously, taking up what, what remains, uh, or what is at the moment, the, the blank uh, in, on the, the plans of Troy. And then, presumably, the houses uh, which have been found are those of uh, palace officials or so, on the sort of normal Near Eastern pattern. People connected with the palace and with administration. Or royal Pres kinsmen. Or, or royal kinsmen or whatever it is. Yes, yeah. That's what you would expect. Presumably the rest of the population lives uh, outside the walls. What about its wealth? Um, the Greek epic makes quite a fuss about horse breeding as being the source of Troy's wealth. Do you think that's plausible? I think it's a very plausible source of local wealth. I mean, the Tro not Troy so much, but I mean the plains directly to the east are still horse breeding territory today in Turkey. Uh, the other thing, from the literally thousands of spindle worlds, it's perfectly clear that uh, one f facet of the economy of Troy is, is uh, wool. Uh, and that's exactly what you would expect. And of course, the one other thing, I mean, if one goes by some of our Pylos texts, uh, slaves, of course. Export of slaves is, a, especially trained slaves, is a, is always a, a, produces a lucrative trade. And that gives a plausible reason for the Trojan War. You really think that there was a Trojan I, War? I th look, um, uh, uh, with many of these things, as we've already <laughs> discussed, I mean, we have no real evidence. We only have a belief. I, I would put it like that that if the Trojan War was a figment of Greek imagination, I mean, it wouldn't have gone down very well. Uh, I think there must be some core, uh, some, some historical core to it. <laughs>
So you wouldn't even rule out the possibility that the seizure of a, a Mycenaean royal woman by a Trojan prince could have been the reason for the Trojan War? The idea that they may have annoyed the Mycenaeans, I mean, is by no means uh, impossible. Uh, people pointed out, of course, that uh, Homer's idea of Alexander or Paris of Troy, I mean, uh, running off with the, one of the Mycenaean king's wives is far-fetched. Uh, I would not say that uh, stranger things haven't happened in the Near East. So was the city sacked, and was it sacked by Greeks? The excavator Carl Blagan found that the city had been destroyed twice during the traditional period of the Trojan War. The city of fine walls apparently fell to an earthquake towards 1260 BC. Tumbled walls and debris lay heaped everywhere. A shanty city built on its ruins was burned by the hand of man some decades later. This, Blagan thought, was Homer's Troy. But only the earthquake city fits the description handed down by the bards. Only this city comes within the heyday of the Mycenaean world, when an imperial expedition might have sailed from Greece. Can the legend be squared with this archaeological contradiction? Legend says the fall of Troy came about in a most extraordinary way. For ten years, Homer says, Troy could not be taken. Its walls were too strong to be broken down by human hands. Then the Greeks built a wooden horse, inside which they hid armed men. Thinking the horse a gift for their gods, the Trojans took it inside their walls. That night, the Greeks descended from the horse, opened Troy's gates, and the city was destroyed. Since ancient times, people have found it impossible to believe in the literal truth of this tale. But now a new and ingenious theory has offered an explanation. The horse is the image of the most prominent god in the Mycenaean pantheon, Poseidon. And according to the legend, it was only through Poseidon's help that the walls of Troy were brought down. And Poseidon, the master of horses, was the god of earthquakes.
the supposed earthquake towards 1260 BC threw down the tops of Troy's walls and towers. According to the new theory, and it is only theory, it was the earthquake which delivered Troy to the Greeks, who seized this moment to sack their enfeebled former friend, plundering its fabled riches and killing its menfolk. So, in the strange folk tale of the wooden horse, the bards were perhaps unknowingly handing down a garbled memory of the wrath of Poseidon. As for the women of Troy, the legend says their fate was the same as all women captives in so-called heroic warfare. They were divided as chattels among the victorious chiefs, taken back to Greece to serve them in their fields or in their beds. Some perhaps to work in the flax fields of Pylos, where a generation or two later they are recorded as women of Asia. Some, says Homer, to draw water at the spring below the hill of Sparta, taking their orders from the woman who had caused it all, Helen, who had returned to Sparta to rule as queen again. Back in Mycenae, there's one last clue to the Trojan enigma, a clue which perhaps takes us closer to the people who suffered and died or were enslaved in Bronze Age wars. This is a piece of grey handmade pottery. It was made in the region of Troy and the nearby island of Lemnos, and it was found along with many other pieces down there in the workers' hovels which crouch below the great citadel of Mycenae. Let the imagination play, and is it not possible that this was made by the same kind of women that we met in the palace at Pylos? Women brought over from Asia Minor as slaves, from Cnidus, Miletus, and Lemnos. Women whose memory, in this case, will far outlive the physical existence of their home, the women of Troy. That is just imagination, I stress. There is so far in our search no concrete proof that the Trojan War ever took place. And the trouble is that by their very nature, Homer and archaeology cannot prove such a fact. In order to do that, you would need primary sources, narratives, documents, letters. You may say, it's impossible that such things could exist for the Bronze Age, but astonishingly they do. And in order to find them, we must go far to the east, into Asia Minor itself, to the Hittite Empire of Anatolia, where, amazingly, diplomatic archives have been discovered which cover this very period, and which could show that a Mycenaean king was campaigning in person on the mainland of Asia Minor, and that perhaps the Trojan War did indeed take place. Next week, we will look at the Asian context for the Trojan War.